Okay. So, in the previous lecture, we discussed some phenomenology of the strong interactions. And in particular, I told you the weird thing about the strong interactions. That they're obviously strong because they make bound states and because quarks don't get out. And incidentally, because um, protons and neutrons have very large cross sections when they hit each other. But on the other hand, we can discuss processes with large momentum transfer without talking about the strong interactions at all. We could discuss the E plus E minus annihilation into hadrons by thinking of it very naively as production of a pair of a quark and an antiquark, uh, purely electromagnetically. And we can think about the scattering of electrons from protons by saying that the proton is some weakly bound bag of quarks and gluons. And the electron comes in and knocks out one quark with a cross section that completely ignores the strong interactions of that quark. Well, of course, this is a little of an oversimplification, as we're going to discuss this week. But the first thing I'd like to talk about is what kind of a theory can make it sensible that what I've just said is correct? And so this is something that um, you folks have some inkling of, because it was discussed in your quantum field theory classes in the fall. In quantum, in if you like, the, the most naive way of thinking about a field theory, there's a coupling constant. It's a fixed number. If the coupling constant is large, the theory is strongly coupled. If the coupling constant is small, the theory is weakly coupled. But you folks know that coupling constants in a quantum field theory can actually depend on the momentum transfer of the interaction. And so this is a dependence which is given by the renormalization group equation. Um, dg d log q, where q is the uh, momentum transfer of the interaction or the scale at which you're analyzing the field theory. And in general, in field theory, this is some non-trivial function called the beta function. And if the beta function is non-zero, the strength of the coupling will change from one scale to another. And so what we need for the theory of the strong interactions is that the beta function is a negative function. So as we go to large momentum transfer, the coupling will become very weak. And conversely, if we go to small momentum transfer, low values of the log of Q, there's a chance that the coupling can become very strong and provide the strength that we need for all the binding and the strong interactions of hadrons and all that stuff. And this property has a name. It's called asymptotic freedom. And most surprisingly, this is actually a property of the strong interactions, or at least of a particular theory of the strong interactions that I'm going to argue to this week is this week is really the correct theory. So what I'd like to do today is to talk a little about these notions of the scale dependence of coupling constants. And um, I'm not going to prove the asymptotic freedom of uh, the relevant theory for the strong interactions, but at least I'll give you some materials to, uh, that will help you understand that. Now, I should say, for those of you who um, want to go more deeply into particle physics, this is something that you really have to understand completely. Um, in the notes, you'll find actually a complete derivation of the leading term in the beta function for um, Young-Mills theory, which will be the basic object of study here. Um, last year, I tried to actually do this whole derivation on the blackboard. It took two lectures, and it practically killed the whole class. But um, it's all in the notes. So uh, those of you who are interested can study it. Um, what I'd like to do today is to explain how to calculate the beta function in quantum electrodynamics, which is not an asymptotically free theory. 
um, a little about Young Mills theory, which will be our main theory of interest for the rest of the week. And then I'll give you the answer in Young Mills theory and explain a little about what's different between Young Mills theory and electrodynamics. And as I say, for those of you who would like to see the complete derivation, uh, it's all in the notes. And so um, if you can't understand what's in the notes, come and ask me about it. Okay. So um, a lot more people have showed up. Are there any questions I should address before I start on this uh, new material? Okay. So what I'd like to do, first of all, is to explain the um, scale dependence, or it's usually called the running of coupling constants in electrodynamics. Um, in electrodynamics, we have a coupling constant E. And E is a function of scale, in fact, observably so, as I'll explain to you in the course of this lecture. It's actually not so hard to understand why E is scale dependent. And in fact, it's even not so hard to do the calculation. So Let's just go ahead. So we can start off with the lowest order diagram for electrodynamics, um, the diagram with one virtual photon, which, as you all know, leads to the Coulomb potential. So this leads to a potential of V equals E squared over R um, over 4 pi R, I guess, in the units I'm using. Um, let's say if this. Uh, virtual photon is exchanged between particles that are softly scattering from one another. Now what I'd like to do is to discuss the radiative corrections to this diagram. So the radiative corrections to this diagram come from several sources. First of all, there can be um, diagrams like this. Secondly, self-energy diagrams that look like that. And thirdly, there's a diagram that affects the photon itself that looks like this, where the photon, the virtual photon converts to a virtual electron-positron pair and then comes back. Now, ooh, okay. now it turns out that these two diagrams cancel. And that's an interesting thing, which is almost a whole lecture in itself. Um, but the motivation for that cancellation is, I think, um, it, it, it's rather easy to express. Um, the electrodynamic, so in, in nature, we see lots of different kinds of particles. We have the quarks, which have strong interactions, the protons that are bound states of quarks, the electron and muon that seem to be elementary things. And we only see one unit of charge. Every uh, proton, electron, muon, etc., has a charge that is almost exactly an absolute value, the charge of the electron. In fact, you can measure this. It's not so hard. And um, it's known that the charge of the electron, the absolute value of the charge of the electron is equal to the absolute value of the charge of the proton to an accuracy of one part in 10 to the 21. So how could that be possible if the value of the coupling of that particle to a photon depended on what kind of particle it is? If we had an electron, we could only have a photon here. If we had quarks or maybe protons, we, if let's say we had a proton, we could have a pion here and other kinds of complicated strong interactions. So quantum electrodynamics rather cleverly um, is able to get around that problem by saying that whatever contributions would come in the a vertex by which the photon couples, those contributions are canceled by contributions that come from the propagation of the particle itself. So in the Lagrangian, what happens is you have um, gamma dot d minus e 
Q is just a, a number, one or two thirds or something like that, A mu. These diagrams correct this term. These diagrams, and maybe similar diagrams with pi on exchange for the case of a proton, correct this term. And the whole effect of it is one big factor of z out in front. So these two vertices get exactly the same renormalization. And their ratio is not affected by diagrams of this type. Yes? I'm sorry? Diagrams with corrections to the external legs? Yes. Like that second one? Um, do they give any contribution to um, amplitudes? Yes. Um, if you, I'm not going to explain this here, but if you look in chapter 7 of my book and you look at the thing about the LSZ formula, which gives the formula for the S matrix, there are factors of 1 over the square root of Z in that formula. And those things get corrections from exactly this class of diagram. Okay. But as I say here, the main effect of that correction is to cancel the corrections from the vertex. So in fact, none of that contributes anything to the strength of the electric charge. So the only diagrams that actually contribute to the strength of the electric charge, oh, and maybe I should say, this goes under the name of the Ward identity which follows from current conservation. And once again, um, if you go to some book in quantum field theory, you'll see a proof of the Ward identity and a proof of this cancellation. In any case, yes? Well, Ward identity we had in quantum field theory. Uh, probably it's related, but it's probably not the same. Let's discuss that all. In any case, the upshot of these considerations is that the thing that gives a correction to the, to the strength of the electric charge is only this diagram, which, as you can see, is completely universal with respect to the species that are on the outside. And so what I'd like to do now is to compute that diagram and see what its effect is. Okay, well, as long as I'm computing that diagram, I might as well compute a whole bunch more diagrams. Um, if I have the electron, the photon propagator, I could have one insertion of, um, this diagram is called vacuum polarization, one insertion of the vacuum polarization diagram. I could also have two insertions of the vacuum polarization diagram, or in fact as many as I want. I could also consider more complicated diagrams, like this one, or this one, let's say, or even diagrams where these guys have vacuum polarization corrections. Um, I think what happens is that it's useful to sum up this series. And then let me just give a name to this amplitude. So this is the one particle irreducible uh, vacuum polarization diagram. And I'm going to give that the name um, I pi mu nu of Q. It has two vector indices because there are two photons coming out of it. Um, then when I consider these diagrams, I'm just going to add some small corrections to pi mu nu of Q. So that's not going to um, significantly affect the answer that I'm going to get when I include these diagrams and the whole series of diagrams that result from them. OK, so if I neglect those things, then I can sum up the series in the top line. It's um, something like minus i over q squared times g mu nu plus a minus i over q squared um, an i pi mu nu of q, and then another minus i over q squared for this diagram. For the next diagram, minus i over q squared um, i pi lambda sigma of q, and another minus i over q squared. It's a geometric series. And it all sums up to 
let's just say that for simplicity that this had the structure g mu nu. It doesn't. But let me just say that for simplicity. Then everything would be g mu nu's. And the whole thing would sum up to minus i over q squared times g mu nu times 1 over 1 minus pi of q squared. And that would be extremely simple. Yes? Uh, the, the terms with more than one, with more interactions. Right. Yeah, but you are not, you're not, you aren't actually ignoring them. You're just putting all the Yeah, I'm, the I'm not going to compute those diagrams today. If I wanted to include them, I'd include them in pi. And then I'll get this answer. And then, um, let's see. If I now have the, um, the Coulomb interaction, that has an e squared in front of this. But pi at least also has an e squared. So all the, um, so the e squareds at the end will come out. The Coulomb potential then will be something like this, e squared over q squared times 1 over 1 minus pi of q squared. And then this correction will then affect the strength of the Coulomb interaction. Now, clearly I was very sloppy here in where the vector indices go. And I'd like to be a little more careful about that because it's actually somewhat something of an important point. If you think about the structure of this vacuum polarization amplitude, it actually has a quite distinct structure. Because if you take one of these photons and you pull it out of the diagram, what you always find is an electromagnetic current, J mu. It's a current matrix element. The electromagnetic current is conserved. d mu j mu equals 0. The Fourier transform of that expression is q mu j mu of q is equal to 0. And so this object, it turns out, must satisfy to be consistent with current conservation that q mu annihilates it when dotted into either vertex. And so then it's a function of the four vector q but q mu on it is 0. So necessarily, it actually has the following form. i g mu nu q squared, sorry, i q squared g mu nu minus q mu q nu times the scalar function pi of 0. And um, oh, I'm sorry. I should have included that here. Um, so to correct this derivation, this would be something like 1 plus the overall q squared here cancels the 1 over q squared and leaves over just the function I called pi of q squared. And also the structure g mu nu minus q mu q nu over q squared. And then the next term would have pi squared. And this thing is a projection operator. So it has the same thing here, et cetera. So the final answer you get is actually this. Um, this object here is g mu nu q mu q nu over q squared plus some thing that's left over from the first diagram q mu q nu over q squared times some constant. This is totally irrelevant because when I compute a diagram like this one, this term here dots into a current here. And for the same reason as I explained over there, q dotted with a current gives 0. So this term will actually never appear in a physical prediction. Yes? The loop the electron, yes. What you get is like right. How is that a current? How is that a current? Oh, because 
If I take J mu, that's psi bar gamma mu psi. So the Feynman rule for that is exactly this. Right? So the Feynman diagram exactly expresses the matrix element of the curve. In fact, um, this object here, which I'm looking at, is exactly the um, vacuum expectation value of the time-ordered product of two currents, the Fourier transform of that. Okay. Yes? Sorry. <coughs> Why, how do you know that what you wrote in the top line there is the expression for the vacuum polarization? Uh. So the argument is the following. Whatever it is, it's a function of Q, which carries two vector indices. So what Lorentz structures can it have? It's Lorentz invariant. So it can only be a function of G mu nu or uh, Q mu Q nu. Those are the only Lorentz structures available. Further, this object has to satisfy the property that if I dot Q mu with it, then I have to get zero. So that tells me the relative coefficients. So Q mu dotted into that being zero is the expression of current conservation. Yes? Can I hide the location by still even high zero? This? Oh, oh, absolutely. So that's a scalar function of Q squared. And so now when I plug that into here, I get this expression. And now when I work out the Coulomb potential, the Coulomb potential is E squared over Q squared times 1 minus pi of Q squared. Now, if you like, let's say that this has a slow dependence on Q squared. So it depends only roughly on what scale I'm doing the experiment at. Then, if I have low energy scattering, I get, I can write this as E0 squared divided by Q squared, where E0 squared is E squared divided by 1 minus pi of 0. If I have high energy scattering, I could write V approximately E squared of Q divided by Q squared, where E squared of Q is E squared over 1 minus pi of capital Q squared. If these two things are very different from one another, then what I find is that the value of the electric charge that I observe at high energy is very different from the value of the electric charge I observe at low energy. Now, which one of these is the value of the electric charge? Well, I claim it's this one. So alpha is equal to E0 squared divided by 4 pi is equal to 1 over 137. This E here we could call the bare charge, the charge in the Lagrangian. And in principle, we're going to calculate pi in a moment. There could be a big difference between the bare charge and the value of the charge at low energy. If I go to high energy, if this is different from this, I'll find a different value of the charge. And indeed, if you do electron-positron scattering at 30 GeV in the center of mass, you can measure the value of alpha that applies to that situation. It turns out to be 1 over 130, not 1 over 137. So um, what are, it seems that I need to do now is I need to compute this function pi and show you exactly what it looks like. And then we'll have a very good understanding of how the electric charge changes as you go from one energy scale to another. Okay. So with that introduction, I'm going to erase all this stuff and do a Feynman diagram calculation. So does anyone have any problems at this stage? Yes? Uh, I have a, a question. Uh, why is your cross-on so complicated? Oh, 
because this one is order alpha. This one is order alpha squared. This one is order alpha to the fourth, I guess. So as long as alpha is small, and maybe I should say as long as the running alpha, the effective alpha at that scale is small, these are going to be small corrections to this effect. And um, I, I just have half a lecture to do this, so I'm just going to calculate that. Okay. okay. Very good. So, yes. Okay. Um, so, in that series you have, uh, you have 1 plus by FQ times the G terms. Yes. Then you sum the geometric term and uh, why, well, why don't the, the G terms appear uh, in the denominator instead of? Oh. Because. Um, so, so here I have G. Here I have Q squared times G mu nu minus Q mu Q nu over Q squared. So that's just a rewriting of what I wrote here. Okay? The Q squared cancels this Q squared, and I have this factor left over. Here, I have two of those factors. But this factor is a projection operator. Its square is equal to itself. And it's going to keep happening. And so I'll just pull that out in front. And then I get pi, pi squared times the same projection operator, et cetera. And finally, it all sums up into this one. OK? Good. OK, so now I guess what I really need to do is to tell you exactly what this operator, what this function pi of q looks like. And to do that, we need to compute this Feynman diagram. It's not so hard. Um, let me just get my notation squared with what's in my notes. So Q comes in this side. This is K plus Q. This is K. This is mu. This is nu. The value of this diagram has an integral d4k. It has a trace because um, fermions go around a loop. It has, if we start from here, let's say, a gamma mu i k slash plus m over k squared minus m squared, uh, gamma nu i k plus q plus m over k squared minus m squared, k plus q, rather, squared minus m squared. Um, it has that trace. There's a minus i e squared because there are two vertices. And there's a minus sign because there's a fermion group. And so that should be the whole expression for the diagram. Very good. So um, let's see. Now um, we need to apply. Did you guys ever compute loop diagrams like this? And uh, sorry, no. Yes, yes or no. Okay. Um, I'm now going to apply some some tricks to this diagram. Uh, these tricks were invented in various forms by various people. Um, uh, Schwinger had a very nice set of tricks that are oh, somewhat abstruse, but loved by his students. I think Feynman is the person who popularized these tricks. And there's a very cool identity um, which uh, Feynman popularized, which is this identity. 1 over AB is equal to the integral dx from 0 to 1. 1 over xA plus 1 minus x times b squared. And it's very simple. If you do the integral, you'll see that it's correct. 
we can use that integral to combine the two denominators into a single expression, which turns out to be very convenient. So I'm going to multiply this guy here by x, this guy here by 1 minus x, just the other way around from the way I wrote it here. And then we'll get the following expression. x times k plus q squared plus 1 minus x times k squared minus m squared gets an x plus 1 minus x, which is 1 and the whole thing squared. Then we can write k squared. That has a coefficient of 1. The cross term here is 2k dot q. And that has only an x in front of it. The next term is x q squared, and then minus m squared. And now there's a very nice thing you can do. We can make this integral rotationally symmetric by defining a new variable k is equal to k plus xq. So this is actually this boldface k squared, except there's one term that we might need to complete the square. minus plus xq squared. And if I complete the square, I'm going to, I need to supply a term x squared q squared. So I should subtract that off, minus m squared. Okay. Very good. OK. So now, that's the convenient variable to use in doing the integral. So let me make that change of variables in the numerator as well. So now I find that our diagram is there are 1, 2, 3, 4 factors of i. So overall, there's a minus e squared, the integral d4k. Actually, k is just a shift of k. So let me write it in terms of the new variable. There's an integral dx. There's a 1 over um, k squared minus the quantity um, x times 1 minus x q squared plus m squared. Oops, sorry. Um, minus. And in the numerator, I have the trace of various terms. Gamma mu k minus x cubed, gamma nu k plus 1 minus x cubed, uh, plus m plus m. So far, so good? So all I did was to take the numerator here, and I plugged in this change of variables. OK. So now, um, what, now I have to do the trace. And when I do the trace, I'm going to get various kinds of factors. I'm going to get factors from g mu nu. For example, the trace of gamma mu m gamma nu m is g mu nu times um, 4 m squared. When I have a structure like this, gamma nu k, this, this is really k slash, I'm going to get some terms with k squared g mu nu, and I'm going to get other terms with k mu k nu. But then if I do a Lorentz invariant integration, these are all going to turn into things of the structure of g mu nu. And there's only one term that actually gives something different, which is the term with two q's. If I have the trace of gamma mu q 
slash times it's minus x q slash gamma nu 1 minus x q slash. That term has a term minus x times 1 minus x times 4 from when you do the trace times 2 because there are two ways to do it, q mu q nu. There's also a g mu nu term. But what I'd like you to notice is the only way to get q mu q nu is if I take this term here and that term here. All the other terms give something proportional to g mu nu. So the simplest thing to do is let's just compute the coefficient of q mu q nu in that expression. And so this is minus e squared times this factor here of minus x. So there's an integral dx minus x times 1 minus x. The integral d4k over 2 pi to the fourth, 1 over um, k squared minus some stuff squared. And then um, this 8 q mu q nu plus terms proportional to g mu. Okay. Okay. Now we seem to be doing very well because this integral over here is pretty easy. Um, to evaluate that integral, what we need to do is to get it out of Minkowski space and into a space where we can actually compute it. And Is this something that you guys talked about last term when you did quantum field theory? Yes? Callum says yes, but other people are shaking their heads. Yes. Oh, OK. Very good. So you know that you evaluate this, this expression using a Wick rotation. And the answer is um, There's a factor of i from the measure when you do a wick rotation. There's a 1 over 4 pi squared. And there's some kind of logarithm of, well, now let's watch. This is a divergent integral. Um, there are four powers of k here, and there are four powers of k in the denominator. So it's divergent. So if we cut it off, we'd have something like a log of lambda squared over delta. And to the accuracy at which I'm going to compute, that's perfectly fine. And then delta here is some function of um, q squared and m squared. OK, so now I claim we have the complete answer. Or at least as much of the complete answer as I can derive in the course of this lecture. So. Let's try and gather everything together. We have i over 4 pi squared. There's that um, minus e squared sitting out here. Um, there's the value of this integral, which is the log of lambda squared over something, let me write a q squared plus b m squared, something like that. There's the integral over x. This depends on x, too, but that's not important. There's x times 1 minus x. And I guess there's one more minus sign there. And there's q mu q nu. The value of this integral is 1 sixth. And so now I can, and then there's stuff that's proportional to g mu nu. And now I can write the answer. Um, uh, oh, there's an 8. Yes. OK. So 8 sixth is 4 thirds. We have e squared over uh, 4 pi squared, 8 sixths, um, q 
cumu q nu, probably it would be good if I just um, use the top line to just supply the g mu nu term correctly. There's another minus sign that cancels this one. And there's a log of lambda squared over something like that. But I might as well just write lambda squared over q squared. I'm only going to look at the slow logarithmic dependence of this quantity anyway. And I think that Yeah, we're now completely done. And um, there's some subtlety with this term, which I'm going to come back and talk about. But if I extract the q mu q nu part, this now has to be the complete answer. And let me write this in the following way. As um, alpha, this is 4 pi, this is 4 thirds. So it's alpha over 3 pi. Uh, there's a minus i. There's q squared g mu nu minus q mu q nu. And then there's a log. And I'm going to get rid of that minus sign by writing this as the log of q squared over lambda squared. And um, if q squared is of order m squared, q squared gets replaced by m squared there. Okay. Okay, well now, um, let me keep that formula at the top of the blackboard. Now we can express the value of the effective charge. The effective charge is E squared of Q is equal to the bare charge, E squared, times 1 minus pi of q. Maybe a, a clear way to write this is 1 over e squared of the bare charge is 1 over e squared times 1 minus pi of q squared. And so then I can use the expression for pi, which is written here. And I can write that as 1 over e squared of q is equal to 1 over e squared uh, minus um, uh, maybe it would be good if I just wrote this as 1 over alpha of q. So that's 4 pi over e squared. That's a con more convenient unit to use. Is 1 over alpha bare minus, let's cancel the alpha there, 1 over 3 pi times the log of q squared or m squared divided by lambda squared. OK. Well, now we're doing truly excellently. Because now, to at least the first approximation in quantum electrodynamics, we found the scale dependence of the electric charge, or alpha, over a range of scales. What you see is that as q squared or m squared, so lambda is some enormous scale. It's the cutoff. This quantity here is negative. So it adds to this and gives a large value of 1 over alpha here. If I am at low energy, then 1 over alpha that I measure, which is 137, is equal to 1 over alpha bare minus 1 over 3 pi log of m squared over lambda squared. If I just subtract these quantities now, I can find 1 over alpha of q in terms of 1 over alpha that I measure in low energy experiments. 
And you see what it turns out to be is um, minus 1 over 3 pi log of q squared over m squared. If I just subtract these two terms. And this is now a very interesting result. This says that as I start at what value, a value of 137, and I go to higher energies than the mass of the electron, I get a minus sign here. The electrodynamic coupling gets stronger. If I go to more higher, still higher energies, the electromagnetic coupling gets stronger and stronger. Eventually, when these, if these two terms could cancel, the electromagnetic coupling would go to infinity. And so now we have a picture of the strength of the electromagnetic coupling, and the picture looks like this. If I write the effective value of alpha, and everything, remember, is on a logarithmic scale in Q squared, at low energies below the mass of the electron, it's fairly constant at a value of 137. As you go up in energy, this is going to rise. And eventually, at some asymptotic energy, it formally goes to infinity. Of course, we can't trust perturbation theory there. But at higher and higher energies on a log scale, it gets stronger and stronger. OK, I'm sorry, you had a question. Um, in the bottom line on the left-hand side, you've got Q squared inside the log. What's that comma and up in the third last line on the right-hand side as well? Oh, yes. See. I didn't actually evaluate the full q squared and m squared dependence of this integral. I just evaluated its log divergence. But by dimensional analysis, there has to be something in the denominator here. So it's either q squared or m squared or some linear combination of them. And so when q squared is much larger than m squared, it's q squared. And when q squared is small, it's m squared. And there's some numerical factor that um, I'm treating as not very important. If you go to chapter 7.5 of my book, you'll see the complete expression, and then you can solve all your difficulties. And I'm sorry, in the back row, you had a question. Oh, OK. Good. OK. So now we have this picture of the change in the electromagnetic coupling as a function of scale. Below the mass of the electron, it's 137. But above the mass of the electron, it slowly increases on a logarithmic scale in Q. Now, maybe I should also say that there's an additional contribution to this expression. Whenever you come above the particle-antiparticle threshold of any other fermion. And so um, if I consider just the electron in the loop, I'll get this expression. If I consider muons in the loop, I'll have to add another term with the mass of the muon here. If I have taus in the loop, if I'm now at q's well above uh, 2 GeV, 4 GeV, I have to include the tau as well. In fact, what I propose as the correct expression is you just sum over all the fermions in nature with the appropriate mass here, as long as q squared is greater than m squared, and with the appropriate charge. And frankly, that also ought to include all the quarks. If I'm at energies of 30 GeV, I'm well above the masses of some of the quarks, and I should include them as well. And so what that means is that if I go above the muon threshold, alpha begins to run a little faster above the tau threshold a little faster, above hadronic thresholds a little faster. And in fact, it runs, well, it still doesn't run very fast, but at least faster than you would get from this calculation. And if you put in the numbers, what you find is that at about 30 GeV, this number is about 1 over 130. At 100 GeV, the number is 1 over 129. Please remember that number, because it's going to come up in next week's discussion. So at the mass of the Z boson, for example, the effective value of alpha is 1 over 129. 
And um, if you want to watch it diverge, that's still, um, I think, 10 orders of magnitude above the Planck scale. So it's nothing that you guys have to worry about. OK? And then I think I put in the figures the measurement of Baba scattering by the HRS experiment at SLAC at 30 GeV in the center of mass. And in fact, that experiment confirms directly that this value of alpha of 130 at 30 GeV is actually the right number. So we actually see the change in the strength of the electric charge when we examine quantum electrodynamic processes at high energy. OK? And um, now, if you uh, invert this equation and you just take the derivative, what you get is the beta function of QED, d by d log g log q of e, is equal to plus um, e cubed divided by uh, 3 pi, 12 pi. 12 pi squared. So if you just um, re-express this in terms of E and differentiate it, you get this expression. There's a plus sign here. The E cubed is because we have one extra power of alpha. And then there are extra terms that come from those diagrams that I've crossed out before, which if you're very strong, you could compute them. Yes? Uh, what is this thing um, above the 3 pi that looks like a QA? Oh, um, it's the charge of the fermion in the loop. So if you have an up quark in the loop, there's a factor of two thirds in each vertex, and you should include that. Yes? The fact that uh, this function diverges beyond the Planck scale, does that tell us that we should expect other part of the content to enter the model at higher energies? Um, yeah, something has to come in here to fix this behavior. But beyond the Planck scale, presumably lots of other things happen. Right, like grab it. Um, you're up. You're still unhappy. What are you unhappy about? I'm very happy. Okay. <laughs> Anybody unhappy? Yes. So there are two different capital Qs, one from the momentum. Yes, I'm sorry. The yeah, the Q sub F is the value of a charge, which is minus one for the electron and two thirds for the up quark. And this Q here is a momentum transfer. And you just keep it straight. <laughs> Okay. Now, um, maybe I should say one more thing about this integral. It's very lucky that I evaluated the q mu q nu piece because that had a log divergence. Um, the piece proportional to g mu nu has somewhat worse behavior. Remember, I told you that when you evaluate the trace, you're going to get some terms that are of the form k mu k nu, and then the denominator is k squared squared. <coughs> so you can see that this expression here is not log divergent. It's actually quadratically divergent. But if that term is really quadratically divergent, it would ruin this equation which is the expression of current conservation. So it's a warning that when you have divergent integrals, you really have to think very hard about how you cut them off and what procedure you use to regularize the integrals. So if you say, I'm just going to cut it off. I don't know about physics beyond the scale lambda, so I'm just going to put a cutoff at lambda. You will get this behavior. And because of the argument I gave here, that behavior will contradict current conservation. That is, it will give a term in front of g mu nu, which is enormously large, and which is not balanced by a term in front of q mu q nu. It turns out that if you regularize the diagram in such a way that current conservation is preserved, then you'll get the answer that I wrote. And this is something that one ought to understand to understand quantum field theory deeply. I just want to call it to your attention now. Uh, once again, if you look at the more careful derivation of this, which is in chapter 7 of my book, there's a special way to regularize the integral, which is used there called dimensional regularization. 
that um, is automatically consistent with current conservation. And when you do things that way, magically, this term cancels. And with other regulators for the integral, which automatically conserve current conservation, for example, the Pauli Villars method that some of you might have heard of, um, again, this term will magically cancel. But it's something you have to take into account. Um, you can't be completely ignorant about the short distance behavior of quantum field theory. In particular, if you have a gauge theory where current conservation is a crucial part of the theory, you have to regularize all of your integrals in such a way that current conservation is preserved. If you do that, you get the right answer. Okay. So now, um, well, this is not a good answer. Because what we were hoping was a theory with a minus sign here. And what we found instead was a plus sign. So let me just tell you that there is a theory that gives a minus sign there. And that theory is the non-abelian gauge theory, or Young-Mills theory. So you folks all know what Young-Mills theory is, right? That was included in your quantum field theory course. So for electrodynamics, you have the Lagrangian 1 over 4, 1 over 4 f mu nu squared where f mu nu is d mu a mu minus d nu a mu. For Young-Mills theory, you generalize this in the following way. Electrodynamics is based on the group U1, the group of phase rotations on a, rotations of a circle. For Young-Mills theory, you take some larger group, like SU2, a non-abelian group. You again write the Lagrangian is 1 fourth f mu nu squared. But now you have a vector field and an f, a field strength, for every generator of the group. For example, if the group is SU2, the group of rotations in three dimensions, you'll have three vector fields. One for rotations about the x-axis, one for rotations about the y-axis, and one for rotations about the z-axis. There's also an extra term in the field strength. Where FABC expresses the commutation relation of two generators of the group. So for example, for SU2, the rotation group, FABC is epsilon ABC, the thing that expresses the commutation of two rotation generators in terms of the third one. Now, it turns out, and I'll give an intuitive argument for this in a moment, that so then this theory has new nonlinear interactions. For example, if I multiply this by this, I'll get a three vector boson interaction, which is proportional to the FABC symbol. If I square this term, I'll get a new four boson interaction, proportional to something like FABE, FCDE. And when you take those interactions into account, there are new vacuum polarization diagrams. So if I think about the vacuum polarization diagram in Young-Mills theory, there's this diagram here with fermions that we thought about before. This is exactly the QED answer times, because we now have to deal with the group matrices, there's a factor of the trace of T A, T B. Um, canonically, um, this is normalized, so this is 1 half delta AB. So from this diagram, you'll get exactly the QED answer and the QED sign, and there's just some funny group theory factor that sits in front of it. But there are other diagrams. For example, this one and 
this one. And, um, oh, let's see. When you quantize Young-Mills theory, there are also these funny ghosts which contribute. And when you add up all these diagrams, you get a contribution of the opposite sign to this diagram. So in fact, the final answer that you get for the beta function is the following. It's over here, beta of g was e squared over 12 pi squared. Um, here we'll get beta of g is equal to, well, first of all, um, g squared over 4 pi squared. Then um, this thing would have an extra 4 thirds. And then that factor of a half means there's a 2 thirds here. And the number of fermions in the theory that travel around that loop. However, there's an extra term, which is 11 thirds C2 of G where C2 of G is defined by the following expression. If I contract two of these F symbols with one another, that's equal to C2 of G times delta AB. And this is N times delta AB for the group SUN, which is probably the only thing you should really memorize at this stage. So for an SUN group, this number here is N. This big number here is 11 thirds. So it's very easy for this term to overwhelm this term unless you have lots of fermions in the theory. And the overall sign in front of that is negative. So very oddly, for Young-Mills theory, the contribution of these diagrams that come from the new nonlinear interactions of the theory itself change the sign of the beta function and they make the theory asymptotically free. This now is a crucial property because this allows us to build a theory which has a small coupling at low Q, sorry, a large coupling at low Q and a small coupling at large Q, the opposite of what you see in electrodynamics, but exactly what you need to explain all of these funny things that I told you about the strong interactions. Yes? So I told you what F was. So if I take two F symbols and contract them, then this can only be proportional to delta AB. And the coefficient here is called C2 of G. It's the name, the quadratic Casimir operator. And the value of that is N for an SU group. So for example, if I have the epsilon symbol, epsilon ACD, epsilon B, CD is equal to delta AB times 2. Okay. Yes? So what exactly, so NF is the number of fermions going around in the loop? Yes, in this you, loop. Like, is there an example of a theory, like, what would a theory look like that has this term, that has like a big NF, and so people oh. get this sign? Um, well, I'll tell you a theory with a pretty big NF. Um, let's say we had, let's say the G uh, let's say that this theory coupled to, were vector bosons coupled to quarks. Okay, then NF would be the number of different flavors of quark. Okay. And there are six. So in reality, you need a number here like five or six. But it turns out that for the theory I'll describe to you, that's nowhere near large enough to turn around the sun. Okay. So now, um, Maybe if John will let me run over time for another five minutes. I'd like to give you a description of why the sign changes in Young-Mills theory. So this is a very hand-waving qualitative argument. But nevertheless, um, I like this argument very much. And maybe I hope you do too. So what's different about non-abelian theories, Young-Mills theory from electrodynamics. 
So one way of expressing it is the following. In electrodynamics, we have Coulomb's law. And we have the phenomenon of, we have Coulomb's law, which tells me that if I put a positive charge into the vacuum, then electric field spreads out from that. One can talk intuitively about the change in the coupling constant with scale in electrodynamics by saying that we have literally vacuum polarization. That is, in the field of this electric field, I produce electron-positron pairs virtually, but nevertheless they're there for short periods of time. And those electron-positron pairs would naturally line up in such a way as to partially cancel the electric field. And so the vacuum in quantum electrodynamics becomes a kind of dielectric medium. In a dielectric medium, the electric field at large distances is smaller than the electric field that you put at the source because the medium polarizes to cancel, partially cancel the effect of the electric field. In quantum field theory, this effect is scale invariant. So you get a little contribution to this screening at every scale. And so in electrodynamics, you can start out with a large charge fundamentally and then at larger and larger scales, there's a bigger and bigger screening cloud made of virtual electrons and positrons until at very large distances, the strength of the field is much less. Then finally, you get to sizes which are of order of the electron Compton wavelength. Then you can't treat the pair production process anymore, and so this evolution stops, and you level off to that value of 137. In Young Mills theory, though, there's one more odd effect, which is that this equation is actually modified to a nonlinear equation. For each type of charge, there is an E field, and this object here is del dot E plus G, and the A field associated with that E field. And let me just do this in SU2. So it's epsilon ABC appears here as 4 pi rho. So this term has a very interesting effect. What I'm going to do is write this equation now with that term on the right-hand side and pictorially evaluate its influence. Okay, so we start out with a charge of type 1, and that type 1 charge has an electric field that goes out through all of space. Now, let's say that over here, by a vacuum fluctuation, there's some A field of type 2. So interestingly, there's an E field parallel to the A field. That's exactly this term. If I have an A field of type 2 and an E field of type 1, that's a source for an E field of type 3. So effectively, it's a charge of type 3. That charge points, that charge is, um, please excuse me, uh, epsilon 3, 2, 1 is negative. That cancels the negative sign. So there's a positive charge here. And, no, sorry. That's good. I've just gotten a little confused. There's a positive charge in this region of type 3. Now, that charge has its own E field. So now, please look what's going on. Up here, there's an A field of type 2 
an E field of type 3, that generates from this, using this term in second order, a charge of type 1. Epsilon 1, 3, 1, 2, 3 is positive. And so combined with this sign, we get a charge of minus 1 up here. But over here, it's turned around. So we get a charge of plus 1 here. Well, this is really odd. The dipole that's supposed to be doing the screening is pointing in the wrong direction. And so it's anti-screening. As you go outward, this odd nonlinear effect makes the strength of the a young mills theory interaction seem larger and larger at larger scales rather than smaller and smaller. Well, what about vacuum polarization? Well, the young mills theory also has vacuum polarization. But it turns out when you compute it that this effect is 12 times larger. And so 12 minus 1 is 11, which is exactly that factor of 11 that appeared in the beta function. OK. So we found a theory with asymptotic freedom. And now what I suggest is that we take it and run with it. And that's what I'm going to do in the next two lectures. So I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.